Well, when I grow up, I want to be able to sing like that too. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Good morning to you. It's a delight to see you this day. We are in Romans chapter 1. We're continuing with our text. And in fact, we're going to begin back again at verse 16. And we will read this time through verse 19. And we will answer a question that burns in Scripture. Is the world really lost? I'll give you a hint. One word answer. Yes. So... Find your scripture, stand to your feet. Let's read. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's on the screen behind me. And so take a look. The Word of God says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Father, please add your blessing and authority to this word that's settled forever in heaven. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the book of Romans has been called the Constitution of Christianity. And the fact of the matter is most Bible scholars consider Romans, aside from the Gospels that is, to be the single most important book in all the Bible. Especially in the New Testament. Excuse me. Romans presents both early and often the good news of God. But I have to tell you something that you've heard me say in other ways and other times. You cannot have good news without also having bad news. And the truth of the matter, and it's something that burdens me as a preacher of the gospel, is the truth that we have a vacuum in what passes for the gospel of Jesus Christ today. We don't seem to want to tell the whole story. We want people to accept the truth so much, we've left out half the truth in order to make the truth feel tolerable. Now, it's good to tell people God loves you and wants a personal relationship with you. That's wonderful news. To say it this way, that God loves you and wants to save you is wonderful. But it's meaningless if someone doesn't think they need to be saved from anything. It's not good news. Now I want you to think about this. I want you to imagine a medical doctor who says, I don't want to deliver bad news. I only want to deliver good news. I will run all the tests that's required of me, but I will only inform the patients about the good results from those tests, never about the bad results, because I can't bear seeing someone in shock over bad news. So don't ask me to tell my patients when they're sick, please. If you had such a doctor and you found yourself suddenly on your deathbed, you'd say, Doctor, why didn't you tell me I was sick? When you hear the gospel preached, ladies and gentlemen, and people don't share with you the bad news, before they share with you the good news, and you stand before God one day never having understood the bad news, so never having felt a need to truly repent and believe the gospel, you would say, Preacher, why didn't you tell me I was in that condition? Paul has begun by telling us, I have good news. But he's also begun by telling us, 
I also have bad news. The good news is this. The gospel of Jesus Christ reveals the righteousness of God. The bad news is the gospel also reveals the wrath of God. The good news is God loves the world. The bad news is the world is lost and doesn't love God. The good news is God reaches out to the world. The bad news is the world rejects God and unless they repent will be forever separated from Him. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the scripture we have in front of us. We have some who want to pull out their pen and scratch through these verses. They want to do what Thomas Jefferson did with his Bible and cut out certain passages from the Bible and have just big gaps there and say, oh, we can't have that. They want a Reader's Digest kind of Bible that abridges and that, that takes out these different things about the wrath of God. They say, why, preacher, do you want to preach such a thing? Let me tell you why. And I'm going to show you some truth today. And uh, y'all just settle in for a few moments and get ready to, to learn a few things about this. But the first thing I want you to understand is the wrath of God is a reality. You see, the Bible defines the wrath of God all the way through it. Now, some people, when they hear the term, the wrath of God, they think Greek mythology. They go back to their classes, their literature classes, and their, their early history classes, and all of these things, and they begin to think Greek mythology. And so they think God's up there. Some God is up there in their mind. They think he's up there throwing a temper tantrum, and he doesn't like the way Jim Armstrong wore his hair today. So he throws a lightning bolt down at him and chunks this bolt down at him just because he's mad in that moment. Some think when they think of the wrath of God that God explodes with anger over your sins. Now I want to tell you something. God doesn't like your sins. He hates sin. God hates sin. Habakkuk says, Habakkuk says uh, you're of, uh, pure, you're too pure to look on sin. Your eyes, you, your holiness is too pure to ever look on sin. So don't you sit there today and think I'm giving you permission to run out and sin. I'm not. But some people think the wrath of God means, well, I'm going to sin. I've sinned last night and I've got to look around every corner because God's going to strike me dead for what I did. You know, there are people out there with that idea in their mind. Uh, it, it, folks, that's not it either. The Bible teaches uh, that wrath does not mean rage, that explosive anger, but it's a cumulative anger that simmers like a boiling pot. It's there constantly boiling. In fact, where it says the wrath of God is revealed, it's a word in present continuous tense that means it's just there. It's constant, in a constant state. It's Static. It's not dynamic. It's not changing. It's not in flux. It's there. Always. And the wrath of God is being constantly revealed against unrighteousness. The Bible doesn't just define it though. The Bible declares the wrath of God all the way through it. You see it Old and New Testament. The book of Revelation is all about the wrath of God after the rapture of the church before the return of Jesus Christ in the second coming. That's what it's about. When you read from chapter 4 on in the book of Revelation, you're reading about the wrath of God against the world. You'll find it in the Old Testament as well. You see the wrath of God in the flood. You see the wrath of God confounding the languages at the Tower of Babel. You see the wrath of God in Sodom and Gomorrah. You see the wrath of God when Israel has to wander 40 years in the wilderness. You see the wrath of God in Israel's captivity in Babylon for 70 years. You see the wrath of God poured out on his only begotten son at Calvary. When Jesus died on the cross, when he was crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Part of what he was saying in that moment had to do with the fact that the wrath of God was being poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ because of your sin and my sin and the sin of all the world. The Bible, the Bible speaks of the wrath of God. Well, 
The Bible also teaches us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against a number of things. It's revealed from heaven against ungodliness. And that's the first word that's spoken there in Romans 1.18, against ungodliness. What does that mean? We're speaking about our reverence and our devotion, our commitment to the Lord God. The Bible teaches that the fool has no fear of God. He doesn't worship God. He doesn't consider God when he makes any of his decisions. If you don't believe for a moment that we've lost our reverence for, for uh, God and our fear of God, just look around for a minute at the empty pews. Or go to the mall and sit on a bench and be real quiet. Put your cell phone in your pocket. Get off Facebook and Twitter and some space or whatever's out there and Instagram and all those fun things. Get off of it and just listen. And you will hear people speak in terms that betray the fact they have no fear of God. Or just turn on the television when you go home. And listen. You see, ungodliness not only deals with reverence, but devotion. And, and I've discovered that we are more devoted to entertaining ourselves than we are committed to God. And one of the reasons why that is so, one of the reasons we can be so comfortable laying out of worship time, obviously I'm not speaking to you because you're here. <laughs> But uh, one of the reasons this happens to us, uh, it, we don't mind missing on, on Sunday, is because we don't mind missing God on, on uh, Monday through Saturday. And we have no meaningful private worship with God. So what does public worship mean to us? We don't spend time with God, so I don't mind missing. After all, I really want to see that big game. After all, I really want to go to that concert and so I'm going to be out really, really late on Saturday and I need to sleep in on Sunday. I don't know if I'm meddling or not, but I hope so. I really hope so. It's not just ungodliness. The, the wrath of God is revealed against unrighteousness. You see, if ungodliness is about reverence and devotion and commitment, then unrighteousness is about relationship. And here's the truth of the matter. People need a relationship with God. People need to know the Lord. They need to be intimately acquainted with Almighty God. They need to, they need to be with God. When God created Adam and Eve, His purpose in creating Adam and Eve is obviously to bring glory unto His name, but He's also creating man to have relationship with God. When Adam and Eve sinned, they broke their relationship with God. That's what happened in that moment. People not only need a relationship with God, they need right relationships with one another. We need it with God, but we need it with one another as well. And when the word unrighteousness is used, there are a number of things that it portrays, and one of them is the fact we sin against one another, and we hurt one another, and we offend one another, and we go around kicking one another, and stomping one another, and disrespecting one another, and, and the list goes on. And you see what I'm saying. We need, we need right relationships with one another. And when you want to engage in some kind of ungodly behavior, some kind of unrighteous behavior, you're wounding not just yourself, you're wounding others with whom you could have a right relationship. Now, anytime ungodliness prevails, unrighteousness follows. The more, or I should say it this way, the less 
commitment you have to the Lord God, the greater your level, your threshold of tolerance of unrighteousness is going to be. Amen. And the wrath of God's been revealed against that. But wait, there's one more thing the wrath of God's being revealed against. And it's the unrelenting rejection of truth. Because he says, against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, E.T. Robertson's one of the, he was a Southern Baptist Greek scholar. One of the big names back in the early 20th century. And he said that holding the truth, King James Version says those who hold the truth. You've read that. If you have a King James Bible, you've read that. Holding the truth or suppressing the truth, which is a more accurate reading of the word hold there, are words that describe putting truth into a box and shutting the lid. So when they use that word hold there or suppress, it means taking something, sticking it down in a box, putting the lid on it, and just holding your hand over the top of it. Just have that picture, if you will, in your mind. Because this is what's happening. And, and the rest of chapter 1 and all of chapter 2 describe different boxes we put the truth inside of so that we can hold it back. And the different ways that we do that. The first box that's mentioned is the box of the lie. The lie. Look at verse 20 of the passage of Scripture that we have. I need you to see this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now look at verse 23. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. They did more than that. Look at verse 25. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now I have to tell you something. The lie is the biggest box of all. I think the other two boxes that I'm going to mention this morning are actually contained within this box like those little Russian dolls that one fits inside the other. Whatever those things are called, don't tell me. I don't care. I don't want to know right now. So the lie, the lie is that. Paul calls it the lie. Your King James says a lie. But it's the lie in the Greek. It's a very definite article pointing to the lie. The lie. Big capital letters. The lie. What is the lie? I need you to go over to Genesis chapter 3 for a moment. Turn in your Bibles to the first uh, book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. And I need you to look at a couple of verses there. Verses 4 and 5 in Genesis 3. We're in the garden. The serpent's there talking to Eve. And he's asking questions. And now he's about to answer some of the questions that he's asked. In verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there's the lie. Let me lay it out for you in, 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 in a share of paraphrase here. You can't be separated from God. That's the first part of the lie right there. You're not going to die. You can't be separated from God. In fact, you can become like God if you will just partake of this tree right here. Now listen to me. This is where I'm going to make some folks mad. I don't really care. You need to get right with God if you think otherwise because I know I'm right in what I'm saying. All right? Listen to me. All false religions, including the religion of evolution, teach that you will eventually become a superior being if you do the right things. That's the lie. And people exchange the truth of God for the lie. 
and it's out there. And people follow it. And they sit there and they say, well, now listen to me. This is true in Baptist churches, in evangelical churches, not just Baptists. This is true across the nation. There are that half the people that say they are Baptist or assemblies or evangelical or whatever it is, 50%, a full 50%, think there's more than one way to be saved. They think, well, as long as you're faithful to your religion, you okay. I want you to know they listened to the lie. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Ladies and gentlemen, if I don't get to finish my message, I want to say it now. There's one way of salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father but by Jesus Christ. That's just in case something happens before I finish. Might be a tornado, you can't ever tell. There's another box. It's the box of moral license. You say, Preacher, what on earth are you talking about? I'm about to show you. Thanks for asking that question. Look at verse 24 in this passage. God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Verse 26. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Verse 27. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful, receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which is due. And verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And the list begins there of all the different things, not just homosexuality, ladies and gentlemen, which I don't even like that word, same-sex attraction is, is more accurate, not just that but all kinds of unrighteousness and uncleanness and sexual immorality and adultery and 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 fightings and 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 broken relationships and disobedience to parents and gossip and 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 rumors and all that junk that comes about in our lives when we say well I don't like it when you do it but God's given me permission to do it Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I don't like to comment on, on the latest piece of trash that comes out of Hollywood. I really dislike it. But I have to. And let me tell you why. Because I actually heard this week of church small groups. Nick and I are all about small groups. We like small groups. <laughs> of church small groups who are meeting together to go see Fifty Shades of Trash. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I've heard this. I watched a man who questioned somebody. I was reading a Twitter feed and I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. And so I read this thing. Sometimes I might spend five minutes uh, on, on, on something like that, on that kind of social media. And I look at it, I say, i got to read this one here. And he asked this man who was talking about how wonderful it was for him, this guy who said he's an active Christian in his church, and yet he's talking about how wonderful this piece of filth is. And he says, and he says uh, uh, everybody got on there and started saying, how dare you attack this man, you hypocrite, you Pharisee, and calling him all kinds of things for questioning and asking, how could you possibly want to go see something like that? Hmm. If you bought your tickets and you lined up for that, shame on you. Amen. And you need to repent and ask God's forgiveness. I 
I'm not surprised at the lost world doing that. They're lost. They don't know any better. They're following, they're following the dictates of their hearts. They're following the course of this world. They're following the prince of the power of the air. But why would a Christian want to follow the prince of the power of the air? God set you free from Satan. Why do you want to go back and be a slave again? I got to save my voice for some other day. Did you know? Yeah, you know this. We actually live in an age in which people actually believe that lifestyles that God says are sinful and destructive are normal, acceptable, and fine. We have been so conditioned and we have laughed over the wills and the graces and the queer eye for the straight guy and all that that came out in the 90s. We have been so conditioned. We actually have a full generation that says, what's, so, what's the big deal? Yeah, just as long as they're in love with each other. The day, they, what was once done under darkness, I can't even speak right now. I'm so ticked off. <laughs> What was once done under the cover of darkness because it was shameful is now done in the daylight with honor. Evil is called good. Good is called evil. There's no shame in sin any longer. Now, if your belief system lead you to think you can do whatever you want and live however you want and be whoever you want to be, you need to repent and believe the gospel. You've got the wrong belief system. You're following the wrong prince. I'm following the prince of peace. I'm following the king of kings, the lord of lords. And that's not his belief system. That's not what he teaches in scripture. That box of moral license of all those things that we mentioned and, and some that we didn't mention there, that is a box of lies, of suppression of the truth. But there's one more box, you see, that I have to mention that Paul mentions, and, and I just want to show you one verse of Scripture with it. It's the box of religious legalism. You see, I need you to see one verse of Scripture. Chapter 2, verse 5, I want you to see that. And... and um, we're going to begin wrapping this thing up. I'm going to do like Paul who says finally five times this morning. Okay. Uh, but I want you to see this. Look at chapter 2 verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the religious legalists who are out there who say that you have to follow a certain set of rules in order to be saved. And if you don't look like me and dress like me and act like me, then certainly you're not saved, right? Well, the law is good, but let me tell you what the law does. The law shows you need salvation. The law cannot save. Nothing about the law can save you. Nothing about a set of rules can save you. It can only give you religious structure in your life, and it might not be the right religious structure. Think on that. I have to wrap this up. The wrath of God has been revealed, but why? Because, you're going to think I'm absolutely crazy, but I don't mind because Pam can certify that I am. The wrath of God is reasonable. The wrath of God is reasonable. You see, if you sit still and quiet long enough, some self-proclaimed scholar is going to tell you that a God who would punish anyone for sin is harsh and unreasonable. I was coming back here a couple of years ago from one of our church members' houses late at night, and I turned on the radio. I have XM radio in my, in my uh, uh, SUV, and, and so I was... I was listening to it and had it on, tuned into this preacher, and, and he's sitting there preaching with all of his might. He's some up there in Kentucky somewhere, and he's preaching in all of his might about 
Uh, anybody who thinks that God would ever punish anyone for eternity uh, doesn't know this God of love that the Bible preaches. He's preaching against hell, what he was doing. I thought, how much of this can I stomach before I have to turn it off? And I sat there and I listened to him because sometimes it's just good to know what dummies think. And so I was listening to him and listening to the, the words of this man as he twisted scripture and distorted scripture and made scripture say what he wanted. Look, they've already called the law on me. They're coming to get me. He wanted to, to see what is said. Um, uh, in this particular case, and ladies and gentlemen, he totally missed it. There are people that think God is such a God of love, he would never punish someone like that. Right? After all, how can you blame someone for following their heart? Just follow your heart. If it feels good, do it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you can follow your heart when it comes to Ole Miss, Alabama, USM, Y, William Carey, or whatever team you want to cheer for. You can follow your heart. Well, when it comes to righteousness, you need to follow God. So what, is, what does the scripture say in verse 19? I know we've got to wrap this up. I know some of y'all are hungry. My stomach was growling at 10 o'clock, if that means anything. <laughs> verse 19, look again at 19. That which may be known of God is manifest in them. You see, the words may be known means, means this. It means God is knowable. That is the word, the form of Gnostic that's used there, of Gnosis that's used there is God is knowable. And God made himself knowable where in man's heart, within man. Now the main way that God makes himself knowable is through your conscience. Every one of you has a conscience. It might be seared in some cases these days, but every one of us has a conscience. The conscience is not the Holy Spirit, but it is that vacuum within you that God has placed there that says to you, there's a God out there. Listen to a man who was in a vegetate, vegetative state for 12 years and then he woke up from that vegetative state. And in his story, he says, although nobody had ever told him about God because he was so young when he, when he went into this coma from meningitis, although no one ever told him about God, he all always knew there was a God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what's true. That's what's true around the world. But the problem is, even though people knew there was a God, they said no, and they went a different way, and they began to worship nature, the creation, rather than the creator. And so God made himself noble in mankind, and God made himself noble to mankind. I, I have to tell you this, and, and uh, I'm about to wrap this up, but I have to tell you this. I told you I was going to say finally five times. That's, that's only three. I've got two more to go. Listen to me. There was this man. He, I don't know if he's still alive or not, but he had a big business, and everybody that went to work for him, he'd give them a lie detector test. I think they ought to give that preachers every once in a while, and I don't volunteer. Okay? Listen to me. The, he, he brought them in and he'd test them. He asked every one of them, tell me about your faith, you know, before he hooked them up. Before he hooked them up. And some of them said, well, I'm an agnostic. I really don't believe in God. So he said, okay. And so he'd hook up the machine to these guys. And, you know, and I don't know how they hook up because I've never been under one of those kinds of lie detectors. This is my lie detector right here, the, the Word of God, you know. But... Um, I, I never have, but he hooked them up, and he says, uh, do you believe in God? If they said no, 100% of the time, it showed they were lying. 
100% of the time. Why? Because God has made himself knowable in you and God has made himself knowable to you. When you look up at the stars at night, that's God saying, Hello! When you hear the birds singing in the morning, it's God saying, Hello! It's God speaking to you. Because he made himself knowable to you. Now you may be wondering why all this talk about the wrath of God. Why not just share the gospel, be done with it. I am. I'm telling you the gospel. And I want you to think you, you're going to love this because how many times have I talked about planes lately. But I want you to imagine being on a plane. These guys are on a plane. They're all on a plane together. And yes, it's another plane's going to go down. And so one of them's sitting there with a parachute on. And he got it strapped to the front. And they say, well, what you wearing that chute for, man? And he says, well, in case the plane goes down, I won't be ready for it. I, you know, plane might go down. Here, I got some others. You want to try it on? And so this guy in his nice sports coat and tie tries on the parachute. And, and he's sitting there and he's trying to drink his coffee and he's trying to work on his laptop and all these other things. He said, this parachute, this thing's just in the way. Oh, no, you don't want to take it off. Plane might go down. No, 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 no. It's not really good for me. It doesn't even match my suit. It's the wrong color. So I'm going to take it off. I'm not going to wear it. <clears throat> but what if that man had said, you really need this parachute? Because the fact of the matter is, we're about to have to jump. You need the parachute. And they said, yeah, that's, that's bad news, man. And they took the parachute. And the stewardess comes by and says, I think you need to take that off. I'm not taking this off for anything because I'm about to have to jump. No way in the world. You see, when we preach the truth about the love of God and we tell folks Jesus loves you, but we don't tell the other side of that coin, we're like that first guy who says, just try on Jesus. Just try on the parachute. But when you tell the truth, your ship's going down. Your plane's going to crash. You need Jesus because this is the truth about you. This is the bad news. Everyone who rejects Jesus will spend eternity where? In hell. Everyone. Without exception. So you need Jesus Christ. Then folks are desirous to put on Christ in all of his splendor and his glory. The wrath of God is presented in Scripture so man will understand his need for God and his need to turn from sin and turn to the living God. That's why. And here's my question. Have you come to a place where you know Beyond a shadow of a doubt, you've repented of sin and you've placed your faith exclusively in Christ Jesus and you have called on him. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord Amen. shall be saved. And he's boss and master in your life. Have you come to that place? Because if you haven't, According to scripture, there hovers over you the wrath of God until you repent and believe the gospel. Amen. Father, this is your truth. This is your truth. And I beg of you, Father, during this time, men and women will respond to the truth. If you need Christ this morning, He's right there. And you just turn your eyes on Him. Invite Him into your life. He's found you 
and he's knocking on the door of your life, you need to let him in. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. If God's told you this is your place to connect with God, this is your place to serve. 38th Avenue should be your home. And perhaps today you need to transfer your membership. Perhaps you need to do that. Father, it's your invitation. Be glorified. I ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.